Well, the attorney general, Kathleen Kane, is back in the news, uh, actually back in court. Medical marijuana is a step closer to passage in the state legislature. And then our popular financial literacy update. Let's get to it. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. I was supposed to say that at the beginning, but I thought I would hold it until now. Well, I'll tell you, we have uh, a great lineup to, uh, uh, today. Uh, the, Catholic, the Attorney General of the State of Pennsylvania, Kathleen King, goes into court on Monday and there's a whole bunch of other aspects of her leadership in the attorney general's office. Joining me, uh, two reporters who have been all covering this, have been all over these stories since the attorney general took office, Steve Essick from the Allentown Morning Call and Brad Bumstead from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Both have been on this program many times. All right, Brad, I'm going to start with you. Give us the broad outline. On Monday, the attorney general has to go into court to face potential charges that say she's in contempt of a court order. Right. Tell our viewers what that's about. Right. It's called indirect criminal contempt. She must appear before a three-judge panel. And what it's about is that uh, two weeks ago, she fired uh, a top lawyer in her office uh, who had testified against her at, at a grand jury and had a <clears throat> protective order, which means he's supposed to be safe from retaliation, and he got fired. So the judge who issued that protective order, Judge uh, William Carpenter, said, uh, uh you know, you come in here and explain this, and the potential is that she could be uh, held in contempt. Yeah. All right, Steve, picking up on this, the individual in, that was fired is a guy named James Barker. Yes. He says that the argument that the attorney general used, at least said publicly, was that this was part of a general office shakeup. But nobody seems to know about that general office shakeup, including Barker. Do I, is that, am I accurate in that or not? Uh, yes, you are. And uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer was the first paper to uh, break the firing of it. You know, they, they, there's been two public reasonings for um, the firing of uh, Mr. Barker. And uh, he, he has told me that, you know, he, he doesn't know which one to believe. And I forget the first reason for the firing, which was, oh, I, I believe it was, um, you know, controlling the leaks, almost as if, it, they, the was that right? No, no. no, go ahead. Now, the first reason was the restructuring of the office. And he said he had never heard of that. And it wasn't until the next day, 24 hours later, that her office uh, said that the reason um, was that uh, um, Mr. Barker supervised uh, the statewide grand juries and there had been leaks and he was responsible yeah. for that. And yeah. yet she, she never specified which grand jury, which leak. And he said, I never leaked anything. Yeah. yeah. So but, there you go. So what, 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 you got two different reasons for, for, for it. Uh, she has to explain to the three-judge panel, including Judge Carpenter, who was the, general, the uh, judge in charge of the grand jury investigation of, of those leaks of, um, that led up to this, which, which one? So does she go in with... Um, which reason does does she does give? She or, use. Yes, or or does she just not answer the question, plead the fifth? I I don't know what she does. Now, Brad, you've covered I mean, in your career, you've written a, a great book about lots of public corruption. Can she act? Could she actually say, "I'm not going to answer questions"? Well, she could under the yeah. law, but politically, wouldn't that be? Yeah, that would devastating? be devastating yeah. to take the Fifth Amendment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, she could do that, but I, I think another possibility here is that in this hearing, fairly or not, uh, she or her lawyers go after Barker, try to paint him as the guy who is, you know, that he did some things wrong, that she had to do this. Right. But as, as employment lawyers have told me, even if he deserved to be fired, no one thinks that he's anything but a great employee, mm -hmm. but if he did, you, you wait. The timing is just the terrible. The timing uh, yeah. is terrible. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, the, uh, br br Brad's exactly right. You, you just you have to think what was Miss Kane thinking to fire this person at this time, knowing full well that that order was out there. It was covered by the protective yes. order, which because, she had because he had testified before this grand jury mm -hmm. that ultimately ended up, you know, in a presentment recommending other charges against the attorney general. Do I got that right? That's correct. Yeah. All right. Now I want to shift to another another subject, and it has to do with. Uh, Steve, I'll stay with you on this. A defamation suit by 
a former undercover agent who argues that his reputation was damaged by uh, what the attorney general did. G give a brief overview of this. Well, when I, I, when I, again, when the Philadelphia Inquirer broke the story about the sting investigation, how Ms. Kane um, uh, dropped a sting investigation involving an undercover informant, you know, giving cash, allegedly giving cash to some Philadelphia lawmakers in exchange for political favors. Um, it came up, Ms. Kane, again, in her defense, was claiming that, that she did not prosecute that because the case was tainted by prejudice, that, right. that the investigators... Racial won, targeting, yes, I think, correct. was yes. the word that was... Yeah, the and that was um, used. so the, uh, the investigator, Claude Thomas, who himself is, is, is black, um, as well as uh, Frank Fina, who's fought with Ms. Kane publicly, you know, they, they denied Another any... Another assistant, yes. top assistant in the office during the Corbett years. Go ahead. Yes. No, and uh, they, they, they all denied, and Seth Williams, uh, Philadelphia's uh, district attorney, all said that, you know, there's, there's no way this case had any, you know, yeah. r racial overtones in any way, shape, or form. And Claude Thomas has, has just now sued Ms. Kane, saying, you know, and, you, you, you defamed me. You defamed and, me. And, yes. And, and a footnote yeah, to that is that the, the grand jury that... Uh, uh, Seth Williams put together in Philadelphia was a racially diverse grand jury. And he's an African American. Uh, he is. Yes. And it was, was a majority um, uh, of uh, minorities, if you will, who served on this grand jury. And, and they have uh, issued indictments against six different people um, as a result of the sting investigation that she wouldn't prosecute. All right, when we come back, uh, Kathleen Kane doing some damage control, hires a new communications director. We'll get into that and then. Medical marijuana, it's inching its way once again through the Pennsylvania legislature. We'll find out from our reporters what that's all about. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Steve Essick and Brad Bumstead, uh, both uh, Capitol reporters, they've been uh, covering a whole variety of stories, this one including the Attorney General, a series of stories involving the Attorney General, Kathleen Kane. All right, S Steve, as I understand this, 17 top staff replacements in a little more than a year. Am I wrong about that? Uh, Brad? Brad? Two years. You, you, two years. Two, I'm sorry, a little yeah. more than two years yeah. since yeah. you and took it, office. Your number's yeah. a little higher than mine, but it's close, you know, 15 or so. But, but mm -hmm. yes, they, they, and just sec, uh, spokesmen and press secretaries alone, uh, we had six who yeah. left or went on to other jobs or were fired, okay? So this week, um, Kathleen Kane hired uh, yet another uh, press secretary, but a very well-known one on a Capitol pro, Hill. A real yes. pro. He is. <laughs> Uh, Chuck Ardo, who was the former press secretary yeah. for Ed Rendell, will now be Kane's uh, communications advisor. And what was interesting is he's, he has a six-month contract. Six it's months. not a long-term investment, yeah. maybe, in, in, in uh, the staying power there. So then, right. we can't, then you can't write a story when he leaves in six months that he was fired. Uh, the, the, <laughs> or somehow, true. some way, there was something yeah. else going on. And, you know... I, I wasn't here when Chuck was R R Rendell's press secretary, but I've met him many times. He always comes through, through the newsroom. Highly regarded, right? Yeah, extremely, yes. Yeah. And, and he, he, he values his reputation. Yeah. Uh, I can see him as being, um, I think the employees in the attorney general's office should be happy he's there right. because the morale there, from what I've heard, is in the toilet. So if Chuck can, can you know, Tell, tell the stories of the work that the employees are right. doing, putting out those news releases. That should help the morale in that office. Um, whether he can do anything to, to stop Miss Kane from not listening to any advice that, that you know, yeah. I've heard that she has yeah. refused to listen yeah. to. And you're shaking your head about yeah. that. I mean, a lot of this seems to be ignoring advice given to her from 
staff people who work for her, you, just ignoring it, the it, advice. It, and it, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, uh, Chuck Ardo can be really outspoken and, and right. opinionated, and he knows what he's doing. Oh, he's a sure. pro. Yeah. But he, he he may tell her, "Look, here's what you need to do to improve your communications." And here's and, and people I've talked to say that she doesn't take well to that. And and Chuck can be very blunt sometimes. Um, he once told me that, that he was fired 10 or 12 times by Ed Randell. <laughs> and he said, and no, then rehired. Right, right. And he said, no, you can't fire me. I quit. And by the end of the day, the governor would call him call up, him and, up say, and say, say hey, yeah. where's that memo you were going to give me? And yeah. he said, I didn't do it. You fired yeah. me. Yeah. Why does that not surprise me? All right. But we, before, before we run out of time, medical marijuana moving through the legislature once again. It passed the Senate, I think, 43 to 7 in the last session. Bipartisan, died in the House. Now we got a new bill, came out of committee. One committee, it has to go to another committee, and before it's up for passage, does contain some differences. Is this going to pass, or anything about these differences our viewers should know? Well, the uh, main difference is, I, I believe, is it, it adds um, AIDS, HIV, and glaucoma. To the to, list of uses uh, for uh, it. For the, but but right. it also clearly defines who can um, write the prescription right. for this. Is that right? that, yeah, that doctors uh, can do it. You know, they so they took away like nurse practitioners or anybody else. Um, I saw vet veterinarians <laughs> yeah. were in it at one point. I don't know if they're well, still well, in dog, it. Dogs may need it too. Dogs yeah. may need some. Mm -hmm. That's true. That, that I mean, pets yeah. and the pet abuse is something we've got to be con well, concerned about. Go and I, I think the uh, you know the the, the, the those changes were as a result of some concerns some House members had yeah. last time around. Whether they uh, the, those changes have, have fixed those concerns and it's enough passage to get through the House, it could be because yeah. I don't know. I don't think the House was willing to really put it up last time because um, Tom Corbett was opposed to it. But yeah. Governor but Wolf wants it. G Governor Wolf wants it now. That that's the interesting question, as you know. The House is more conservative than the Senate. Am it I is. saying anything you would disagree with? No, no. More conservative in the. Now, as Steve points out, they did make these chance these changes that put more restrictions. I think that's the way I would put it. You've been covering this stuff. Eh, like yes, it, it, no. it gives it, it gives it a real shot mm -hmm. in the House. I mean, House passage is by no means guaranteed. But overall, you would have to put this among the, the top five bills or so that, that have a pretty good chance of passing, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, it's, it's a little dicey in the House, but if they make these changes and some of the conservatives 20, can vote against it, maybe, but, but yeah. yeah. 20, 23 states now have some medical marijuana legislation. Look, and and I, I was just going to say that the, the parents of these children are uh, coming in the Capitol a oh, lot. Yeah, it's and very it's, emotional. It, it is extremely emotional to, to watch and to listen to them. And so I think um, a Senate Majority Leader, uh, Jay Corman, said it best is like, how can you tell these people no? How can you tell these families no? He All said right. he couldn't do it. So. All right, we're out of time. Thanks for, for the update. All right, our popular financial literacy update is coming, and we're going to talk a little bit about young folks, students, uh, what should they know, what should they do in order to prepare for their long-term financial future back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania, and by the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, representing companies involved in America's most affordable, reliable energy source. To learn more, visit PACoalalliance.com. Welcome back. Well, it's Financial Education <clears throat> Month, financial you know, connected to financial literacy. Joining me to talk about that with some good advice is Mike Wishnow. He's often on the program. He's a senior vice president with the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. And Sarah Weiser, she's a public relations manager with PSECU. Now, in all fairness, I'm a member. Just want mm -hmm. everybody to know that. So you have to treat me nice, Sarah. All right. <laughs> Mike always does. Uh, at any rate... Let's talk a little bit, uh, Michael. There's a, 
Jumpstart Coalition Financial Education did a, a, you know, did some surveys and some others, and the results of this are are, are almost they're serious, but they're almost ludicrous. Yes. I mean, go just give us a couple of the. Well, this sure. is what folks think. You know, adults and parents think about money. Go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, you know, fifty-three percent of uh, uh, parents agree that their kids think that money grows on trees. Oh God. Okay. Um, 70% of parents say that, they, that, that their kid does not get enough financial education through their high school curriculum. When you talk about teenagers, teenagers are spending $170 billion, with a B, with a B. in the economy today. Yeah. And mostly on, most iPhone, not, mostly on iPhones. And, right? and games and whatever the heck else. <laughs> right. But not a whole lot's going into savings. Yeah, I so they're it. not developing savings habits early enough. And, and you know... We're, we're going to suffer as a as a society because of yeah. that. All right. Why don't you know we have we have lots to get to, Sarah. Let me tu- let me turn to you. One of the things that uh, that I want to talk about is it's it's clear that parents need to do more. And I think I'm guilty. We're probably all guilty of it. We're not pointing fingers here. We just all probably need to do more. And 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 obviously schools have a responsibility here too, right? Right. Um, It's a little bit scary. I think we work especially with college students and we see a lot of college students that are graduating, not necessarily knowing how much debt they have, not understanding how to pay it back because you're seeing more helicopter parents that are doing all of their loan applications for them. So while they're trying to help, they're actually hindering and students are leaving without much education as to what they have in debt, how they even begin paying that back and how that's going to impact their future, not just immediately, but really in the long term. Yeah. Well, what's sort of scary to me, you know, as a lifelong college professor is on, I'll go in sometimes at the beginning of school in various places, and I see these rows of folks with the credit card applications, you know, get your credit card, get your credit card, without, I think, much in the way of an understanding of the implications of all of that, that, that Mike. So your, your argument would be, and we've talked about this, and I know that schools are really really just loaded down with things that they have to do. But you've got a relationship, you've developed a relationship with schools to help enhance their curriculum. Talk about that a bit and why schools should should do this. Sure. Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, through our foundation, uh, our not-for-profit arm, we have credit unions in 217 different schools. And we've reached more than a quarter of a million kids in the last five years. So there are partners out there, local credit unions, and PSECU does a fantastic job, that's willing to partner with the schools to help deliver the material if the teachers don't feel comfortable teaching it. The other point to be made is that it's not necessarily one extra subject. There's a lot of basic financial literacy concepts that can be woven into what's already taught. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a math lesson, you do it with money. If you're doing a reading lesson as early as kindergarten, you read The Berenstein Bears Trouble with Money. Uh, It talks about wants and needs. I mean, you can sort of wrap the financial concepts around what's being taught in the classroom rather easily. Now, we also strongly uh, support a capstone course that every high school student in Pennsylvania ought to take at least a one semester course in personal finance mm-hmm. before he or she graduates yeah. so mean, that they have think, a baseline. Yeah, Sarah, when you think about it, I mean, look look what we do in, in life. I mean, it, much of our time is spent managing our own financial resources. I mean, it's basically how we live. It's the money we make, the money we spend. We've got these big purchases, real home. I mean, is there more important? They're telling me we got to go to a break. When we come back, I'm going to get into a little bit of that and ask you what resources are available and what can be done. We'll do that, and we'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care.
This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Business Council and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation. All right, we're back with the it's uh, Financial Education Month. I think I got that right. Is that yes, right, Michael? Yes, absolutely. And uh, we're, we're chatting with Mike Wishnow and Sarah Weiser. Okay, let's supplement, help out the school, supplement what your parents do. Well, there's a lot of resources available for parents. They can look to the Pennsylvania Jumpstart Coalition for Financial Literacy. Jumpstart Coalition. Coalition. Okay. Um, they can look. Junior Achievement is a great organization. And, of course, credit unions are a fantastic resource. Um, you can look to supplement something that your maybe a teacher is doing in school. You can look for activities at home, activities in your community. Yeah. Um, credit unions, we really try to focus on helping our members improve their lives. So we try to be a resource for everyone. Yeah. So where, where, do, where does the, your activities in increasing programming and education go as we, you know, move, move forward? Well, again, it, we're talking about as young as three, as old as 83. Uh, it, it literally runs the gamut. Um, and as Sarah said, uh, uh, most credit unions, in fact, most financial institutions do have special programs for kids. Yeah. And, and they typically highlight them in April. Uh, I'm sure you guys do that, yeah, right? Right. right. April is National Credit Union Youth Month. So for us and for credit unions across the country, this is really a time to focus on telling parents, here are some tips for how you can get your, your very young children, your teenagers, even your older children that are kind of out of the nest, a little bit more financially literate. Um, you can see it on our social media, on our on-hold messaging. A lot of uh, credit unions will have things happening at their branches. So, so parents feel a little more empowered to help yeah. their families. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, using the social media more with, you know, things like 10 tips to be aware mm -hmm. of. And is that, is that the wave of the future, you think? I think it is. And I think the other wave of the future is gamification. What, 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 oh, gamification. G games, games. Making everything a game. And now there's financial amazing. literacy <laughs> stuff out there that the kids can take and turn it into a game. You guys yeah. are doing a lot of the You have a lot of games. Game I have stuff. to get some of those and yeah. give them my grandson. Go yeah. ahead. Absolutely. So we began kind of revamping our financial literacy program, looking at seminars and workshops. And finally, we realized students are in class all day. Yeah. You know, from kindergarten through college, they're in class all day. So we do things that might be sort of Jeopardy themed or trivia themed, or we even have financial literacy bingo that covers different terminology. Yeah. So we try to make it interactive and we try to kind of slip the learning in with the fun. Yeah, that's great. Well, before, I mean, I, I'm, I'm into these brain teasers. I don't know if you do any uh -huh. of those ones called luminosity. I'm trying to figure out how to keep my mind sharp. At any rate, great, great update. We're glad you could come in. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, stay well.